Throughout the story of Beowulf's fight with the dragon, the poet makes several allusions to the Yates' ongoing feud against the Swedes, or Schiflings. Three Yatish kings die in battles against the Swedes, and this feud returns ominously at the end of the poem. The poet also deliberately introduces this story as a new thread in the interlaced structure, so the reader should know more about the feud and how the poet uses it in juxtaposition with Beowulf's final fight. Unfortunately, like the Finsburg episode, the poet assumes that the audience is familiar with the feud, so he makes only passing references to it, and they are not in chronological sequence. So here's a summary of this feud, separated into five phases. Phase number one, after the death of King Hrethel, Ulther and Onola, sons of the Swedish king Ongenthiau, invade Jetland and inflict heavy casualties at the Battle of Freosnahil. Phase two, in retaliation, the Yates invade Sweden under Heithkin, King Hrethel's son and Hyalak's older brother. At the Battle of Ravenswood, the Yates capture Ungenthiau's queen, but Ungenthiau counterattacks, rescues his wife, and kills Heithkin. Hegel arrives with reinforcements. In the ensuing fight, two of Hyalak's men kill Ungenthiau, and the Swedes are routed. Phase 3. Eanmund and Edgils, sons of Ulthera, who is probably dead at this point, are exiled by their uncle Onola, who succeeded on Genthiau to the throne. They are given refuge by Herdred, who, is succeed- who has succeeded his father and has become king of the Yates. Onola invades Yetland and kills Herdred. His thane, Hwaelstan, who is Wiglif's father, and we'll meet Wiglif in a few lines, uh, Wailstan kills Eanmud. After the Swedes withdraw, Beowulf becomes king. Phase 4. Supported by Beowulf, Eadgils invades Sweden and kills Onola, where he presumably becomes king. And lastly, phase 5 is a phase anticipated at the end of the poem by the, by the Yates. Despite Beowulf's alliance with Eadgils, the Yates expect that the bad blood between us and the Swedes is bound to revive. Once they learn the outcome of Beowulf's fight with the dragon, the Swedes will almost certainly attack, thirsting for blood vengeance. Some of this story is told by Beowulf himself as he and his eleven thanes sit on the cliff top before attacking the dragon. As they rest, the poet tells us that Beowulf was sad at heart, unsettled yet ready, sensing his death. His fate hovered near, unknowable but certain. It would soon claim his coffered soul, part life and limb, before long, the prince's spirit would spin free from his body. Lines 24.19 to 24.24. Sensing his death, Beowulf then recounts how the feud with the Swedes began after King Hrethel died of sorrow over his son's accidental death. This speech is important because the poet is telling us that Beowulf was thinking about his death and about the, spe- uh, about the Swedish threat. This speech also deepens the overall atmosphere of loss and sorrow that just gets heavier and heavier as we read. Though it's not clear on the first reading, the poet's constant allusions to the Swedish feud amplify what is at stake in Beowulf's fight with the dragon. John Layerly, an Anglo-Saxon scholar, explains the effect that these allusions have on the poem. Layerly writes, Beowulf's preparations to fight the dragon are constantly intersected by allusions to the Swedish wars, ominous warnings of the full consequences to the Yates of Beowulf's dragon fight. In this way, the poet undercuts Beowulf's single-minded preoccupations with the dragon by interlacing a stream of more and more appointed episodes about the human threats to his people, a far more serious threat than the dragon poses. Lairly goes on to say that these interruptions to the narrative of Beowulf's fight with the dragon are obvious to the reader, they interrupt us, but we're caught up in the drama of Beowulf's fight, and so we're tempted to read quickly through the interrupting lines, just to to get him out of the way so we know what happens in the fight with the dragon. Thus, Laerly argues, the Beowulf poet causes us to repeat Beowulf's error. To repeat the error, one all too easy in heroic society, Laerly says, hardly noticing that glorious action by a leader often carries a terrible price for his followers. Laerly goes on to say that he, 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 he seems to imply that he thinks that Beowulf's actions were foolish, they were, they were rash and the wrong ones to make. 
I disagree with Layerly's evaluation of, of Beowulf's choices, but I think he makes an important point. Beowulf had to fight the dragon in order to protect his people. Beowulf does not mention the danger of Swedish invasion if the fight goes badly, but he does talk about the previous battles with the Swedes before fighting the dragon, which indicates that the Swedish threat is on his mind. He can only choose to take up arms against the most immediate danger to his people, as any good king would. By reminding us of the Swedish threat throughout the dragon fight, the poet first of all, deepens the sense of inevitable doom and loss, and secondly, underscores Beowulf's intractable dilemma. If Beowulf fights the dragon, he risks Swedish invasion if he dies or is wounded. But if he doesn't fight the dragon, the worm will continue to ravage his people. If he manages to kill the dragon without being wounded, then he will end the dragon's tyranny and prevent Swedish invasion. That is the only honorable option available to a good king like Beowulf. And the poet's use of the Swedish feud amplifies that Beowulf is forced into a difficult situation beyond his control.